I would like to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees from this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and we want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. Those are both crucial to our success. So now I'm going to switch slides and turn things over to Senior Program Officer, Chayla Scott Weber, who will go ahead and kick us off. Take it away, Chayla. Thanks, Marilee. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I think most of you, it's still morning. Maybe it's lunchtime for some of you. Um, so thanks for spending your lunch with us. Um, so I'm just going to do a brief um, introduction to, uh, to the working group and then hand it off to my colleagues. Um, but uh, as many of you may already know, OCLC has a, a long history of working in archives and special and distinctive collections and research libraries. Um, we work in special collections because we really recognize them as an important site of knowledge creation and know that that's made possible by the library's commitment to stewarding um, these collections and that the, that the unique nature of special collections can make them a real challenge. Um, for and so we work to identify areas of kind of common need and and patterns of both need and innovation to help libraries kind of scale up learning and, and expertise across these um, sometimes challenging collections. Uh, so part of that work in October 2017, we released the research and learning agenda for archives, special and distinctive collections, um, which was created via a, a participatory kind of community driven process and articulates a set of shared challenges and opportunities for research libraries in the sphere and suggest some approaches on working them together. And the agenda is really driving the work that we're doing in this area right now. Um, and, and therefore, we're trying to do um, webinars that really connect to that as well as working groups and other, uh, um, other work. So we're giving a whole set of webinars this year that, that respond to the agenda. And um, I'll talk a little bit more now about how um, uh, the working group itself responds to the agenda. Um, so, so the agenda really, um, there's a real emphasis on appraisal um, being a key both skill and activity and that it, and that there, we need a sort of renewed sense of um, energy and uh, inquisitiveness around appraisal. Um, to, to deal with a lot of different um, issues that we're facing right now. So, um, and this working group responds to that need, but also really recognizes um, the connection between the work of collection building and collection management, and that um, understanding the, the sort of institutional resources and capacity for collection management um, is key to our ultimate ability to live up to our obligations to our donors and our collections and our users. Um, so we see the working group as um, addressing this, but also addressing other issues that are surfaced in the agenda as well, issues around the need for skills and advocacy, uh, for, um, for assessment, uh, collecting data for reporting and assessment, um, for living up to our broader stewardship responsibilities, and for valuing um, the labor that goes into the responsible stewardship and care of special collections. Um, so uh, with all of that in mind, um, when I was at the RBMS conference last year, I saw Carrie uh, Hintz, one of our, our presenters today, give a presentation about some work she'd been doing at Emory. And after and speaking with her, I learned that she'd also been working with some colleagues, uh, Sarah Schmidt at, at Duke, uh, Matthew Beacom at Yale, and Susan Pazinski at Harvard on kind of generalizing the tools that she's been working on, and they were realizing that they needed more input and a broader set of voices to move their work forward, and that was kind of how the this working group was born, <laughs> if you will. Um, so we have uh, some goals for the working group. We want to explore that kind of intersection that I talked about between collection building and collection management. Um, find ways to better integrate collection management considerations into decisions about collection development and bring our bring colleagues with these skill sets and responsibilities together to work together um, and our goal or our hope is that we will um, get better at <laughs> at doing these things uh, uh, 
communicating with each other, determining operational impact and kind of total cost of ownership of collecting and informing better decision making and ultimately better stewardship. We're working on a white paper, um, a kind of a toolkit of sample documentation um, and and you'll hear more about that shortly and, uh, and just to help implement these uh, strategies that we're thinking about. Uh, we're really excited that the working group membership, there was broad interest in being a part of the working group. So um, we ended up with people in a really wide range of responsibilities for curatorial collection management and administrative roles and in both academic and independent research libraries. So we're happy to see that. Um, and I'm really grateful to everyone in the working group for the time and work that they're putting in. Um, so I will now turn it over to Gordon Danes, who's the head of our literature review subgroup. A quick update on the annotated bibliography uh, and the work that we're doing and what we're hoping to accomplish with the annotated bibliography. Um, you should be seeing pretty soon in the uh, chat a link out to the annotated bibliography. And one of the things that I will say up front is that this is a work in progress. Uh, we don't pretend to have identified every potential article book uh, that could be added to the annotated bibliography, and we would love to hear from the community. Uh, the major purpose of the annotated bibliography is to ground the work of our larger project, to help us to understand what's out there uh, in terms of um, the business process, understanding what the business process is for archives and for special collections, how do we actually go about acquiring material, bringing it in. Uh, the annotated bibliography aims to make connection points. Um, we want to really understand uh, what's the, what is the impact of appraisal on accessioning? What's the impact of accessioning on um, processing or arrangement and description? of these items uh, and how do we start making connections so that we can identify the points where we can potentially um, figure out what the costs are. Uh, one of the goals of the working group is to understand from A to Z what does it cost when we actually bring materials into uh, special collections or archives. The annotated bibliography is broken into a number of different sections. Uh, I won't review all of them, uh, but to give you a sense for the kinds of things that we're looking at, we're looking at the overall business process. Um, we're looking at appraisal, cost estimating tools, uh, the value uh, that special collections and archives bring to uh, the institutions uh, where they're located. And that's probably it. Um, Again, we would really like to have your feedback on the annotated bibliography. We hope you'll go take a look at it. Uh, you can contact me directly at gordon underscore danes at byu.edu, and I can uh, add your feedback. Um, and um, that's really what I've got today. Thanks. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Carrie Hintz, um, the Head of Collection Services at the Rose Library at Emory University. Um, so Gordon was talking a little bit about trying to get a better understanding of the impact that each function in a library has on the other functions. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we determine what those impacts are and how we communicate them to others inside and outside of our institutions. Um, so I'm chairing the communication tools subgroup, um, and I know that everyone loves it when you read a big block of text that someone, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, so this is the scope of our subgroup here. The communication tools subgroup will create a suite of tools to assist selectors and other special collections professionals responsible for collection development to collect and share information regarding potential acquisitions with stakeholders. These tools will help repositories develop policies and best practices to support sound collection development and will support selectors' efforts to gather and share information about potential acquisitions, assess and communicate the impact of an acquisition will have on repository staff and operations, to communicate with donors and administrators about the resources required to effectively steward a collection, and to articulate and promote the value that library workers' labor and expertise bring to bear on collections and collecting decisions. So to kind of boil that down a little bit um, and look at what the goals and outcomes of this group are, 
is we really want to create a suite of tools that will help assist selectors, resource allocators, and technical services managers collaborate on how to select, resource, appraise, and steward new acquisitions. So really quickly, the timeline that we have been using and working on here, um, we really started our work in earnest as a group in January. And we started really by thinking about workflows um, and drafting out some sample workflows for new acquisitions and then trying to identify where within those workflows we could use some tools to help facilitate effective transfer of knowledge about an acquisition. Um, and then from figuring out where we might need some tools, we jumped into identifying some possible tools to create or to find good examples of out in the community. Um, and then sent out a call for community samples in April. And right now we're kind of right at the point where we are looking at what we got back from the community, looking at what we use in our own institutions, um, and kind of identifying the tools that are out there um, and determining what we need to create or modify beyond that. Um, the next steps then will be to kind of refine and test those tools um, and then present the tool suite out more broadly. So, like I mentioned, we started with a workflow analysis. Um, so really thinking about what do we do at the different points when you're potentially or definitely acquiring a collection? Um, what kind of pre-custodial work goes into that? What is the actual acquisition and transfer work that happens? Um, and what are the ongoing stewardship responsibilities? You know, if this is a collection that is maybe slated for digitization or will need a lot of um, conservation work, things like that. Um, how are we thinking about and planning for those things and communicating that within our institutions? So here's our workflow document. It is very pretty. Um, sort of online collaborative whiteboarding is probably in development here, but um, here's the basic sort of thing that we outlined when we were going through. And just as an example, thinking about what do we do when we're acquiring a collection and then thinking at each of those times, you know, at what point are we making decisions about a collection? Um, whether, you know, it's an appraisal decision, that's kind of a key one. Um, decisions about acquiring things, decisions about how to resource it. You know, what are our decision points that we may need to document? Um, when are we making appraisal decisions or doing appraisal on a collection? Because that, as we know, happens in many places throughout a workflow. Um, when do we need to be thinking about costs? Um, either cost of the collection, cost of the labor to steward the collection, things like that. Um, and when do we need to be communicating out about those things, about our decisions, about the appraisal, about cost, and who do we need to be talking to? Um, so then we took all of these different places where we thought we could use potentially some, some communication tools and we categorized them. Um, so we came to the large buckets of policy and local practice documents. Um, collection assessment tools, internal communication and advocacy, and donor and external communication. Um, so within the policy and local practice, and this is where kind of keep your eye out everyone because these are the tools that we've kind of identified that we think um, might be useful for folks. But if you're seeing anything here that, you know, or not seeing anything here that you would like or that you need, um, please do let us know. Like we're really looking to get some feedback and make sure that the tools that we're creating are what people out in the field actually need. Um, so very open to feedback and, and ideas on this. Um, anyway, policy and local practice. We looked at um, thinking about collection development, policy templates or examples um, to help kind of craft that just very basic institutional context, um, a levels of description documents a processing or cataloging plan or template um, for things that come into the repository, a checklist of pre-acquisition and acquisition steps, um, a checklist of the different types of documentation that you can or should or may need to have, and then transfer tools for electronic records. Within collection assessment tools, um, and I think this is probably our biggest bucket of tools, um, looking at a background research form to help folks do some, some research about donors or potential donors, a field notes template um, so that 
when selectors are going out in the field, we can give them some tools to help collect the information that they're going to need to bring back into their repository to make a case for a particular acquisition and to help the people who are in technical services understand what kind of impact this will have, make sure we have enough space for it, you know, all of those types of things. We can plan processing or cataloging. Um, this template is also will be really key for the work that Mary is going to be talking about when using this, these inputs to think about how much it might cost um, to acquire and steward a collection over time. Um, again, electronic records survey to use out in the field when working with donors. Um, talking points document to guide conversations. Um, I know at my, at my institution, the selectors and curators are not necessarily the same people who do the, the technical services work. Um, so we have some people who or maybe our electronic records archivists who have a lot of expertise there can write out a little bit of a script to help guide the conversation to make sure that they're getting the information that they need um, if we don't have as deep expertise in that area um, among the curatorial team. Um, we have an ingest checklist for when things come into the repository, um, you know, checking for things like mold or damage or things like that, um, and a preservation assessment template. Within the internal communication and advocacy bucket, we have um, what we're calling preliminarily an operational impact report, um, which is going to take all of those, those inputs we're getting from the field records assessment and see how running those through the calculator, the cost calculator tool that Mary will talk about, and then creating some kind of report that we can use to go to funders or administrators um, and give them a real sense of what a collection will entail to bring into a repository to steward it and to manage projects around it. Um, so kind of an internal advocacy form. And then um, a digit digitization consideration form. And then for donor and external communication, I'm putting together kind of an information packet for potential donors explaining a little bit more about what it means to give the material to a special collections library or archive. Um, and also a donor communication checklist. You know, at what points are we communicating back out with a donor about the material that they have um, donated to us? So those are the main categories that we're thinking about and the pieces of documentation that we're planning on putting together examples of. Um, we will also be thinking about putting together some documentation for you all as our colleagues who might be using this tool to kind of help um, contextualize that and explain how we were thinking about these tools being used. So that brings us to where we are now. Um, so we've collected the sample tools and worksheets and forms um, from the call out to the community. So thank you all for anybody who sent things in. I see some people on the call who I know provided some of your documentation, which has been fabulous and really helpful. Um, so now we're trying to come up with the best exemplar exemplars of those different documentation types. Um, getting feedback right this very moment. We are getting feedback um, from our colleagues about what you might need or want and where informal or formal communication tools could help support your work. Um, and then I think our final step will be then to step back and think about reintegrating those forms into a workflow um, so that you can look across a workflow that we're all somewhat familiar with and say, okay, at this point, um, you know, at the point that we have decided to bring in a collection and we need to go and do on-site appraisal, here are the forms or the tools that may help me do that. Um, once something comes into the repository and we're trying to think about developing, you know, a plan for processing or maintenance, here are the tools that may help me do that um, so that we can go in and see specific to the workflow piece that we're looking at, um, what it is we may have out there that can help people. Um, so I think that is pretty much all I have um, in terms of the communication tools. So I will now hand it over to Mary to talk a little bit about um, how they take these inputs that we're communicating about and turn it over into an actual cost estimator. All right, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Carrie, for setting me up there. Um, switch over to my slide. Um, so, again, my name is Mary Kidd. Um, I work at the New York Public Library in their Preservation and Collections Processing Department. 
I am their systems and operations coordinator, and we're based out of Long Island City in Queens. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about the subgroup I've been leading these past six months. Um, we call ourselves the Operational Impact Estimator Subgroup, or OIE, and our tool is called the Operational Impact Estimator. Um, so there are eight of us in the group. We come from a variety of institutions, including a couple of universities, um, museums, and I come from a large public library system. And we meet about once per month for about an hour. So this slide here just shows you a basic timeline of the work we've done since um, February, though uh, kind of like Carrie, we did start meeting officially in January. Um, so I'll go through each one of these points in a little more detail in a second. Um, but generally speaking, the first three months, so February through April, um, that was dedicated mostly to research. So we drafted a scope statement, um, we reviewed some existing tools and literature, and we wrote up a list of major functions and activities. Um, so May onward, um, we're entering more in our kind of a development phase. Um, so we're workshop, uh, sorry, workshopping how our tool will work. Um, we're developing some methodologies and transposing our work into a spreadsheet form, um, do some more testing and documentation, and then eventually you know, sharing it out with the greater community. So given kind of the diversity from uh, where each one of the group members come from, um, one of the first things that we set out to do that we thought was really important was to write up a scope of work statement um, and you know, this is some a uh, way that we felt we could sort of align our vision for what this uh, estimator tool would do, um, what it would look like, and also kind of uh, start framing out what our work would look like. Um, so this is a quote from the scope document. Um, I won't read it through, but basically, um, again, we're defining kind of our group, um, the basic form our tool will take, how we'll test it and present it out. Um, one thing to highlight is the fact that we envision the tool being very lightweight, so taking on the form of a spreadsheet, which we imagine that people will just go and, you know, download it from a website and then work on it um, on their own, uh, on their end. Um, we've tweaked the scope document a few times, and I think it will be interesting at the end of this process to see kind of um, where we began and where we end up. Um, but generally speaking, we've stayed on task and on target. So uh, the second task we set out to do as a group was to document two things. Um, the first was relevant literature to do with cost calculation or estimation in a library or archive setting. And the second thing was to actually go out and seek any existing cost calculators or estimators or any other tools available either on or offline. Um, so the literature we get gathered, we eventually merged that over with um, uh, the annotated bibliography document that Gordon shared with you earlier. Uh, so the purpose of these two tasks was to familiarize ourselves with what was out there and also help us begin to devise a list of relevant features that we wanted our tool to have. Um, it was a way also for us to offset having to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Um, there's already some great tools available out there that do a pretty good job at what they, you know, what they do. So, for example, um, I included a screenshot of the DLF cost uh, cost calculator, um, and this is a free online tool developed by a DLF working group. Um, it's very well documented. They have a great wiki talking about how they kind of came to create this great tool, um, and it. Cost out image capturing. So for this aspect of cost estimation, our subgroup will likely just refer users of our tool to use this DLF tool um, and just talk about that in our documentation rather than sort of building out that sort of um, feature in our tool from scratch. So that's just one example of a tool that we really liked that we will likely just refer people out to. So we kind of took um, the gathering of tools, um, existing tools out there um, a step further, and we laid them all out on what we call the Operational Impact Tools Inventory and Function Grid. I like to call it the matrix uh, myself. Um, here we attempted to map out the various features of each tool that we found. Um, this was 
a pretty important exercise because now we have a pretty quick and easy way to visually identify which tools up there already cover certain features. So that, let's say we want to build a certain feature out and we want some inspiration, we can just go to this matrix and go, oh, this, this tool does X, Y, and Z, and we can click on a link out to that tool and we can model out whatever we are building from there. Um, so that has been a very helpful document to build up. So um, we proceeded to work on breaking out from our list of literature and tools, a list of major functions and sub activities beneath each function. So this took on the form of a Google Doc, which I'll show you in just a second. Um, but it starts off with these two paragraphs just to premise like uh, what we're setting out to do with this document. Um, so an example of a major function um, would be um, pre-acquisition. Um, so anything that happens kind of before the acquisition enters the door of the institution. Um, and an example of an activity kind of nested under that uh, major function of a pre-acquisition um, is a site visit or preparing a collection for transport from the donor storage space to the collecting institution. So that's just an example of a, of a major function and an activity. So this is a screen cap of this uh, document of major functions and activities. So you can see here that this document was structured in a sort of hierarchical bullet point form list. Um, we came up with five major functions. Um, so those are pre-acquisition, acquisition, processing, post-acquisition treatments, and post-acquisition priority usage. Um, and these functions sort of mirror in many ways the brainstorm diagram that Carrie showed you a few slides ago. So it essentially outlines an acquisition workflow from the point at which it's considered by the institution through to when it is served out to researchers or patrons. So this list um, is essentially our subgroup to do list. So for each function and activity, we will be developing out a corresponding calculation methodology. Um, so in the midst of doing this work, um, Chela connected us up with Dennis Massey, a program officer at OCLC. Um, our subgroup had him as a guest speaker for our April meeting. And Dennis led a team of partners through a sort of similar process in developing the OCLC interlibrary, interlibrary loan cost calculator for a period of two years. Um, obviously, ILLs are much different in nature from you know, acquiring a collection. But despite this, we knew that it would be really important to hear from someone taking on a similar endeavor and developing a tool to cost out an aspect of library operations. Um, and my greatest takeaway from his talk was, you know, to keep it simple. Um, you can get pretty atomic when it comes to building a tool like this. Um, and there's kind of a point where you ask yourself, like, hey, should I be accounting for the time it takes for um, staff to remove staples from a piece of paper. Um, this is something that I came across actually in a piece of literature that I um, had gathered for our initial task. Um, you know, and it's, these are questions that you have to ask yourself and then kind of, you know, come back to scope, come back to reality and, and make sure that you're keeping it as simple um, and as straightforward as possible. That's a great takeaway from, from hearing from Dennis. Um, so between the scope document we wrote, the literature we gathered, and talking to Dennis, uh, we were in a pretty good shape to proceed with our work with the idea in mind that we are not going to create the be-all and all of estimator tools, and that's okay. So um, that brings us to where we are now. Um, so just last week, our group convened and workshopped a uh, calculation. So we started with our list of functions and activities document, which I just showed you. Um, we chose archival processing is what we would work through as a group. Um, so I prepared a little worksheet that took a calculation methodology for calculating the cost of processing one cubic foot of archive. Um, this methodology is outlined in one of the pieces of literature we gathered. That's Thomas Wilson's Computing the Total Cost of Archival Processing, published in 1989 in the Merrick the leaflet series. Um, I broke out the methodology into calculation steps, and as a group, we stepped through it together. Um, and at this point, some subgroup members brought up some really valid critiques. Um, obviously, this is kind of 
an older um, piece of literature from which this methodology came from. So, you know, there were some inconsistencies and some other critiques that were brought up, which are totally valid. Um, and in working through this together, we were able to set the tone for our work going forward. Um, so that was just last week. Um, so where are we at this month and into June and July? So this month, we've assigned each major function out to one member of the subgroup. So each member will be responsible for working out calculations for each activity listed beneath each function. And then in June, we will reconvene and discuss and share our work um, among ourselves in the subgroup. And once our methodologies are aligned, we will transpose our calculations into a spreadsheet We'll test and refine, we'll do some uh, thorough documentation, and then hopefully share it widely. Um, it's worth mentioning at this time that both Carrie and I, um, we, we asked our group of volunteers to liaise between the communications tool and estimator tool subgroups to kind of keep each other apprised of our work. And this is especially important when we start to factor in things like processing levels, um, you know, it obviously takes less time to process an archive at a box level than it is in an item level, and that will uh, affect cost. So we wanted to make sure that our groups were aligned on them um, in that way. So um, that is, in a nutshell, where we stand as a subgroup. And so I'm going to switch it over to the last slide here and just point out that um, our emails uh, um, for everyone that spoke today, Gordon, Carrie, and myself, are listed there. And uh, thank you for having me, and I'll hand it over to Chela to lead a Q&A. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mary and Carrie and Gordon. Um, so we um, so we really, you know, part of this sort of today, uh, the, the, the webinar is to, to be transparent about where we are and also to, to share that um, our work so that we can get feedback from all of you. So we're interested in any comments or questions you have, but we have some um, some kind of guiding <laughs> questions that uh, we'd love to hear from you all about. You can put um, questions into the chat, and I will kind of MC here and make, and make sure that they get answered. Um, so, you know, can you see your, yourself using some or all of the kinds of the tools presented by the group today? Um, or the kinds of tools, um, if you see yourself using them, you know, could you explain for how, how or for what purpose or how they might be received, do you think? And, and also, of course, what, um, what do you think we're missing or we might be lacking or, um, so those are, we'd love to hear from you about that and we'd love to hear just any general questions you have about the work and where we are. Um, while I'm waiting for you all to madly type into chat, um, I'll mention that we do have a proposal in for a pop-up session to SAA. We, I don't know, we don't know if it will be accepted, but if it is, we'll be doing a workshop there um, on the documentation as it stands in, in late July, early August. Um, and we'd be really excited to have that opportunity to get kind of on the ground in-person feedback from anybody who attended. Um, and then uh, we'll also be, you know, we are interested in concrete feedback as, on what we've presented today. Um, it, we don't have a solid deadline for that, but it would be most useful um, probably in the next month or so as we're, we'll be actively developing tools. Um, so. Oh, this is Marilee. While we're waiting, I, I had a question, um, which could be, uh, Maybe falls into Mary's uh, bailiwick, but but others may have comments on this as well. So I was uh, thinking about in terms of the different steps and stages. Um, are there particular areas that um, you see as kind of places where you can get stuck in an eddy, uh, where you're kind of having to return and repeat different processes, or does that um, to you know before you can advance, um, or does that uh, fall into the category of removing staples. Um, <laughs> That's a good question, um, because especially comparing getting tripped up by eddies and processes. Um, you know, one thing that we didn't quite address, I, I think Carrie kind of addressed this with her communication tool presentation is, um, this idea that there's there's a lot of handoff 
between each one of um, these major functions. Um, we have a lot of different players coming in at this from all different sides of, um, you know, either a very large or even a small institution. Um, and kind of the interplay between kind of getting a piece of information at one point and then fielding that out to inform or push along a process in another, um, it could be another department or through another unit, um, you know, but, well, that all takes time. It'll take, you know, either someone writing an email or convening a meeting or several meetings. Um, you know, you have kind of um, approving bodies and and all sorts of sort of activities happening as you are sort of inputting information into these tools. Um, so, yeah, I, I can anticipate that, you know, none of these tools are kind of an A to B linear um, type of uh, uh, thing that you can use, I think um, there's definitely going to be some, some interplay and, and some places where people might feel stuck, but um, that's yet to kind of be um, known, um, since no one used these tools yet so yeah. far. Yeah. But when we did that, the sort of workflow analysis, we really did recognize that um, and wanted to support iterative approaches to work. We do understand mm -hmm. that some stabilization happens at um, when you're bringing something in and some happens after it comes in and some sort of initial arrangement description cataloging work might happen early and then you may revisit things again. So we want to make we want to make tools that support a kind of iterative approach to work and um, doesn't lock in you know, one way of doing things because we don't think that's realistic. Um, but, and we want them to be flexible, you know, we want, really we want these tools to support communication and thinking kind of forward and holistically about um, about cost of ownership, sort of what, you know, they call in software total cost of ownership, right? So um, not just the purchase price of a collection, but the kind of ongoing cost and impact and over over time and over iterations. Um, and that's another place where we have to have some flexibility because we're not going to cal calculate out storage costs for the next 100 years, but but we <laughs> can think a little bit about sort of what does that look like as a as an operational impact question versus a like distinct exact dollar amount. These aren't about distinct exact dollar amounts. These are about just sort of weighing pros and cons and thinking about opportunity cost and thinking about um, just thinking holistically about decision making. Yeah, and I would add, um, we're thinking very much in the communication tools subgroup about how do we make sure that information gathered at every point in this process stays with the material to a certain extent. So we're refining and changing um, our understanding of a collection or the actual like makeup even of a collection if we're appraising things out or making selections. Um, but how are we capturing those actions that we've taken and the decisions that have been made um, and the changing landscape of information and keeping that with the materials so that everyone who then has to come in and make some additional decisions um, regarding the collection at different points will have access to this sort of full landscape of information rather than the sort of piecemeal things that I think can sometimes happen um, in a lot of workflows now. Um, so we have a question um, about the the cost estimator. Is it expected to be used for comparing costs between and among institutions, or is it intended to be used only within one institution? Um, and that's, I, a, that's a great, great question. question. <laughs> we have been developing it as a standalone tool that someone would download and use on their own, not as a tool where where uh, the research library partnership or any other organization is gathering data. Um, we thought that would be a barrier to implementation and possibly to use, and so we didn't want to do that. But I think it could potentially be used for institutions to talk with one another about about sort of benchmark um, cost. I don't know what other folks think about that. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much how we envisioned it. Is is being used um, by the institution within the institution, but it could potentially be 
used in the future for something um, broader. But, and hopefully, I mean, once the cost calculator is out there, the people will talk about their experiences in the literature and enable kind of that communication that way. Um, really, the major purpose of this is to help us better understand what are the overall costs that we incur in an institution in, in acquiring material. And I'll add that um, it may not have been totally obvious from our presentations, um, and because we are all kind of primarily archivists, we are developing this tool to, to deal with both book um, and bibli bibliographically controlled um, collections as well as archival collections, and we do have participants on the group with um, expertise in those areas, and we're, we're trying to make sure that we um, don't default to archives just because we all work in archives or came up through archives. Um, I, I wonder, um, Carrie, if you would be willing to talk a little bit about your um, experiences in, in implementing some of these things or the early iterations of some of these things at your institution? Sure. Um, so I started probably about a year and a half ago implementing something, kind of a lightweight version of this. Um, after a conversation that I had with one of one of my uh, the curators at my institution came to me and said that he was thinking about uh, acquiring a collection of Polaroids, um, a very large collection of Polaroids. And so he had been advised by our administrators to talk to me about what kind of special needs that format may have and if it was something that was reasonable and that we would be able to to manage effectively. And so that situation kind of kicked off my thinking about like, of course, we should be having these conversations about every collection we're bringing in. Um, we should be able to do this analysis about not only what is the intellectual value, but also what is the value that it's bringing or taking from the organization in terms of staff capacity in time, in expertise, and things like that. Um, so I came up with a pretty, pretty lightweight form that we've been using here at Emory that um, help selectors gather some of this information um, about the size of the collection, um, you know, the number of books, the linear footage of an article or collection, whatever it may be, um, and some known, if there's any known condition issues or formats, um, format specific kind of things that we would need to take into consideration. Um, and then I took those inputs and put them through my own set of calculations about what that would mean in terms of how much it may cost to move a collection, how much it may cost to process a collection, um, if there were any other broader considerations, if we needed to consult with our conservation department or digitization unit, um, or talk about digital storage with other people in the building um, to make sure that when we were making decisions about these acquisitions, um, the curatorial group and the administration had a fulsome sense of what it was that we're getting ourselves into when we bring something in. Um, so we've been doing that, like I said, for about a year and a half now. And I would say that it's been pretty successful. Um, it's been really, my administrators certainly have been really pleased to have a little bit more information and in thinking about how to make these decisions and um, being able to step back and think holistically. I think it's helped quite a bit with the communications between different pieces of the library and not just within my special collections unit, but, you know, thinking about we're doing a much better job now of you know, thinking about do we need to pull in someone from conver conservation to go do a site visit um, before we go out and, and bring in a collection and do a preservation assessment on site and things like that. So I'm looking forward to having more of these tools to be able to work with and implement. Um, but we have had some good success and I think we've seen much improved communication um, here at Emory. That's great, thank you. Um, so we have a couple more questions here. Uh, Karen, uh, my colleague Karen Smithio Shimura asks, are the costs of digital preservation one of the functions included 
in the um, operational impact estimator uh, for digital or digitized collections? Yes. The simple question of this, I'm uh, sorry, the simple answer to that is yes. Um, there are some things like I, I mentioned, um, you know, the DLF uh, uh, cost calculator for imaging, um, that's more of like a, like a transfer cost. Um, so there are certain points in the tool where we will kind of refer to another calculator. Um, but in terms of the cost of um, you know, digital storage and um, board digital archival processing and, um, you know, those things will be represented in, in the estimator tool. Great, thanks. And another question from um, Helena Zink at uh, Library of Congress, I believe. Um, for long-term storage costs, could the ingredients of a calculation formula be included? So as has been done for long-term book and microfilm storage, and she's thinking especially about the impact of oversize and cold storage. Yep. Yeah, certainly, and, and that's something that um, on the New York Public Library side, I mean, we we have a lot of things stored and outside storage um, at Recap, um, but it's, that's certainly something that we will factor in into the estimator tool. Um, obviously, you know, people are coming at this from various institutions with different sorts of um, storage setups. Um, so, kind of like we were talking about before, you know, these tools are not meant to sort of lock you in into one sort of calculation framework. Um, the idea is that if you have um, certain costs, you can kind of just plug them in into this in sort of a modular um, way. And then um, if like you have kind of the cost um, uh, of cold storage, for example, and you wanted to factor that in into your overall um, estimation, um, uh, this could certainly um, handle that. It would just be kind of you know one extra formula in a row. Terrific. Thanks, Mary. Um, so, oh, all right, one more um, from Rachel, Cersei at NYU. Do any of the tools address operational impact of collections as it relates to issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and in terms of helping individuals and institutions make decisions about appraisal acquisition and prioritization? Um, I think that's a great question, Rachel, and we have recently circulated um, the slides from uh, a presentation at, at CNI. Um, Scott Ziegler, I think his last name is, at LSU, gave a really smart um, and frank presentation about trying to um, incorporate thinking about those issues in just in their digitization queue and prioritization. Um, and so we're thinking about, we've been thinking about how to um, incorporate, uh, push some of those questions into um, into the tools and, and frameworks that we're, we're working on. Um, does anybody else want to respond to that question? Yeah, I'll just say um, a great point. Oh, sorry, Carrie. There you go. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I wanted to point out um, one of the things that we talked about last week when we met as a group um, in going through that methodology created in 1989 um, uh, that basically um, it was calculating the cost of processing one cubic foot of, of archives um, and it excluded things like paid time off and the cost of healthcare. Um, and that's something that you know, as a group, we decided that that we would not exclude those factors in our um, in our estimator tool. Um, and I think that these efforts that we are um, kind of taking in, in creating these tools, um, one is sort of to readdress how we as a kind of archival community address labor and um, hopefully in kind of reincorporating back these um, elements into, into our calculations, we can use that as a way to advocate for resources, for staff, um, and to really sort of lay out there the, the kind of um, overall and exact cost of, of labor. So 
Um, but that's a great question. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, and I was going to say something similar um, that in the work that we're doing, the way we're thinking about it, um, we're trying to be really explicit about recognizing and elevating certain types of labor um, that is maybe often a little bit unseen in many of our institutions. You know, technical services type work or conservation work, you know, these things may happen at a processing table or in the lab. And so making the not only labor, but also putting a value on the expertise that goes into that is something that we've been thinking uh, really explicitly about. Um, but I really love some of the, you're making me think, Rachel, about some ways that we could be a little bit better about calling out what it is that we're prioritizing and prompting people to do some thinking around that. So thank you for the suggestion and we will take a look at if there is there good ways to integrate that into some of the tools. Um, and certainly in my local practice, I will. Um, and if and we would welcome other ideas, examples, articles to read to think about this. Um, Shannon O'Neill, I see that you're on the call, and I know that's something that you've thought about at Barnard. And I was looking at your uh, just your research registration form recently um, and thinking about that. So if you have ideas, we'd love to hear them. Okay, um, we have a few minutes left if anybody has further questions. And <laughs> if not, we're happy to give you six or seven minutes back in your day. Um, oh, Shannon, no problem. I'll follow up with you via email. <laughs> um, and, uh, and um, all right. Going once, going twice. No further questions? OK. Um, I we'll uh, sorry, Marilee, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say I don't see any questions. Um, and I wanted to just uh, thank people for their uh, participation and also uh, let you know that the webinar has been recorded. And we will um, be sharing that out with you uh, via email as well as a link to the slide so that you can explore some of these links further. Anything else, Chayla? No, just please feel free to get in touch with me, Gordon, Carrie, or Mary with feedback or questions. We really, we welcome, we welcome them. Thanks very much, everybody, and this concludes today's webinar.